How you doing people? Elevate Truth TV again and today we're going to be going into the third in the series of Battle for the Souls of Our Children. Now over the last few days we've been hearing a lot of things about school with the advent of the new mutant gene so to speak. I keep calling it the mutant gene like it's from the X-Men trilogy um, of films because there's more than three obviously. Um, but the mutant, the mutation, COVID-19, the mutation that's what I call it. There's been a few mutations mentioned. And one of the things they're thinking about doing is keeping the schools closed over January. But even prior to this, I've been hearing certain things about school testing. And now they've been able to ramp up that idea by talking about the fact that teachers are going to be the ones who are going to be testing our children. Now, as I say prior to this, I started seeing images like this, like this one, like this one here, and this one. In fact, there's been loads of these kind of pictures that show the children with things around them, masked up, you know, partitions all over the place um, in order to keep this social distancing going on. Now, one of the main things that I have been um, analysing and thinking about, mulling over in my brain, so to speak, is the fact that how this is going to change human behaviour and how it's going to change the, the children because as people really do know, the ones whose eyes are open, this is a global reset and they have been laying the blueprints of how they want humans to behave and how they want humans to be in the future. Now everybody over a certain age is finished, they're not interested in those, but they are interested in the children who will be the, um, the workforce, the slaves of the new world. So I want to give you an idea of what's happening because um, one of the things I've noticed and one of the things that a lot of research has been done on is the fact that we as humans, we, we don't just um, listen to people's voices in order to understand their um, emotional states and stuff like this. We read their faces and from an early age as a baby and right through into adulthood but very much in the early development, developmental stages we learn how to read people's faces um, you see this when a mother is interacting with her child or a father is interacting with their child baby you know the child is will mimic and will read the face and it will understand the emotional state of somebody whether the person is happy or sad or angry or any variant of the emotion so with the advent of masks what's happening is we're going to be losing that ability, especially as these masks are being enforced with younger and younger children. I saw, as you can see, these pictures of masked up children, you know. You know, now we're actually getting toys with masks on. And it's an indoctrination that is going to be prolonged for a long time. So, I want to go into how behaviour works. And to do that, I'm going to go back to a man called Ivan Pavlov. Let's take a look. Around the turn of the century, the great Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov made an accidental discovery that was to become a landmark in the field of learning. Pavlov was studying the salivation reflex in dogs as part of his research on digestion. He noticed that after the dogs had been brought to the laboratory many times, they would start to salivate even before food was given. What had altered the dog's inborn salivation reflex? Pavlov was fascinated and changed the direction of his research to focus on what he called conditional reflexes. Pavlov knew that placing food in the dog's mouth naturally caused salivation. The unconditioned stimulus food produced the unconditioned response, salivation. Through a series of ingenious experiments, he found that if a new and unrelated stimulus, like a bell, was repeatedly sounded before the food was given, the dogs would learn to salivate when they heard the bell, even when no food followed. The conditioned stimulus, the bell, produced the conditioned response, salivation. Moreover, almost any type of stimulus when paired with food could produce salivation. This process of learning by association became known as classical conditioning.
Pavlov's contribution in introducing the concept of classical conditioning was to bring to us an understanding of how we learn by association, how we learn that one thing leads to another. This has been particularly important in helping us understand how certain autonomic or automatic physiological uh, responses come to occur in new situations in which they didn't normally occur. Individually spoke after this short segment talked about how we have come to understand behavior and he's definitely talking about human behavior but in case you believe that this experiment that was done back then to do with dogs and how dogs can be conditioned is the right word conditioned because it's about learning and conditioning I want to show you this so that you know that it's not just about animals, it's about human beings. So let's go in. We see how this works with animals, but how does it work with humans? In exactly the same way. Let's say that one day you go to the doctor to get a shot. She says, don't worry, this won't hurt a bit, and then gives you the most painful shot you've ever had. A few weeks later, you go to the dentist for a checkup. He starts to put a mirror in your mouth to examine your teeth, and he says, don't worry, this won't hurt a bit. Even though you know the mirror won't hurt, you jump out of the chair and run screaming from the room. When you went to get a shot, the words, this won't hurt a bit, became a conditioned stimulus when they were paired with the pain of the shot, the unconditioned stimulus, which was followed by your conditioned response of getting the heck out of there. Classical conditioning in action. So this is one type of conditioning that we um, are understanding here. But now let's flip it into operant conditioning and see what is said about this because a lot of times when I make my videos I don't want um, people to challenge me because I'm not basing anything on scientific um, consensus. So let's go into operant conditioning to see what is said about that in a very easy to understand form. So how does operant conditioning work? There are two main components in operant conditioning, reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcers make it more likely that you'll do something again, while punishers make it less likely. Reinforcement and punishment can be positive or negative, but this doesn't mean good and bad. Positive means the addition of a stimulus, like getting dessert after you finish your veggies, and negative means the removal of a stimulus, like getting a night of no homework because you did well on an exam. Let's look at an example of operant conditioning. After eating dinner with your family, you clear the table and wash the dishes. When you're done, your mom gives you a big hug and says, thank you for helping me. In this situation, your mom's response is positive reinforcement if it makes you more likely to repeat the operant response, which is to clear the table and wash the dishes. Operant conditioning is everywhere in our daily lives. There aren't many things we do that haven't been influenced at some point by operant conditioning. It's clearly stated here that there's no area in human interaction and in human life where this form of conditioning doesn't take place. And you can analyze it for yourself to find out how you was conditioned as a person and how people are conditioned. You know, whether it be crossing the street, you know, whether it be going into a shop. Now, obviously, people break their conditionings in some shape or form. Um, but we're not talking about the breaking of conditioning. We're talking about how these young people in the schools are being conditioned and what is the future of the people that are going to be conditioned as a result of what's going on in the schools and the way people are being segregated and more importantly in the future they're going to be looked at as you know biohazards a threat to people within their classrooms and circles now i'm going to take it even further because obviously we are we are somewhat away it's very close but we're somewhat away from the ultimate goal in what's going to happen. So I'm going to look at China. I want you to look at this article, you know, from a Chinese school where they are pushing things forward because the Chinese um, society is the blueprint of where we're going. So let's take a look at this. Teachers at this primary school in China know exactly when someone isn't paying attention. These headbands measure each student's level of concentration. The information is then directly sent to the teacher's computer and to parents. 
China has big plans to become a global leader in artificial intelligence. It has enabled a cashless economy where people make purchases with their faces. A giant network of surveillance cameras with facial recognition helps police monitor citizens. Meanwhile, some schools offer glimpses of what the future of high-tech education in the country might look like. Classrooms have robots that analyze students' health and engagement levels. Students wear uniforms with chips that track their locations. There are even surveillance cameras that monitor how often students check their phones or yawn during classes. These gadgets have alarmed Chinese netizens. But schools say it wasn't hard for them getting parental consent to enroll kids into what is one of the world's largest experiments in AI education, a program that's supposed to boost students' grades while also feeding powerful algorithms. The government has poured billions of dollars into the project, bringing together tech giants, startups, and schools. We got exclusive access to a primary school a few hours outside of Shanghai. To see firsthand how AI tech is being used in the classroom. For this fifth grade class, the day begins with putting on a brain wave sensing gadget. Students then practice meditating. The device is made in China and has three electrodes, two behind the ears and one on the forehead. These sensors pick up electrical signals sent by neurons in the brain. The neural data is then sent in real time to the teacher's computer. So while students are solving math problems, a teacher can quickly find out who's paying attention and who's not. A report is then generated that shows how well the class was paying attention. It even details each student's concentration level at 10-minute intervals. It's then sent to a chat group for parents. The reports are detailed, but whether these devices really work and what they exactly measure isn't as clear. We were curious if the headbands could actually measure concentration, so one of our reporters tried on the device. This is a new technology with still fairly little research behind it. Theodore Zanto is a neuroscientist at the University of California, San Francisco. He was surprised to learn that this tech, called electroencephalography, also known as EEG, is being used in the classroom on children. It's usually used by doctors in hospitals and labs. EEG is very susceptible to artifacts. And so if you are itchy or just a little fidgety or the EEG wasn't set up properly so that the electrodes didn't have a good contact, affects the signal. Despite the chances for false readings, Teachers told us the headbands have forced students to become willingly, disciplined. Willingly, the parents, the children are all embraced, they've all embraced this kind of technology that is basically out of a science fiction movie. You know, a way of controlling human behaviour, not, not to, um, to a nightmarish degree, controlling it to a nightmarish degree, turning children into robotic entities. Now, I'd like to point out a couple of lies because the neuroscientist in this segment that we've just seen said that he doesn't understand, you know, the ramifications because not enough research has been done in this area. And he also talked about um, the fact that this technology, if not applied properly, you know, it can give false readings or, you know, it can be jittery and stuff like this and it can throw the readings off. Well, one of the things they did in the classroom was get the children to meditate at the beginning and people might wonder why this is done the reason why it's done is because they want the children to be as relaxed as possible at the beginning so that the technology they're using can get a baseline state of them being very very still very very um, their brain waves very inactive and that's done with meditation. 
Now once the computer gets a baseline for all the children in that room, it can then find out if the children are getting agitated, if the, and then it can apply certain stimuli, certain things to make the children come back into line, similar to Pavlov's dogs. Very interesting, don't you think? And that neuroscientist is not telling the truth because with this technology, the ultimate goal is not to have these kind of halos similar to the film Minority Report. No, they want the technology within the human being. And that's coming too. So people, I've done this short video to show us how the souls of our children are slowly being taken away while we sit around wondering what's happening and trying to get the freedoms back that we believe we should have and that we used to have. But I need people to understand the controllers of this world are, are finished with the old world. They want a new, a new world now. They want humans to interact in a different way. They don't want mass gatherings, they don't want socialising. They want people locked off in their boxes, joined together with technology and nothing else. Human interacting, interaction should be a thing of the past. You know, human interaction should be a thing of the past. So that's why the children are being taught in the schools that their friends who they used to hug and play and jump around with, play tag and stuff like this. They want those kind of things to be over with, to reprogram the children, to be soulless creatures, psychopathic in a way. Because if you're not able to relate to somebody on an emotional and empathic level, you're basically a psychopath. So we need to know how the souls of our children are being stolen right from beneath us without us even seeing it happening. But that's my job. That's why I'm here, that's why I'm doing this, that's why I'm saying these things to the teachers, to the pupils, to the parents that are watching. Now, I don't have really any say in my children at the moment because many of you who have watched these videos that I do will know the reasons behind that. But that isn't going to stop me fighting for the souls of the rest of the children and my children too by saying and doing what I can while I can. No, not at all. Why? Because this is Elevate True TV. So let's keep the humanity free. Bless you all and I'll speak to you very soon.